This is episode 84 with lead science writer for 538.com, former state champion in the 1600 meter run, and the author of the new book, Good to Go, what the athlete and all of us can learn from the strange science of recovery, Ms. Christy Ashwanden. Hey, hey, everyone. Hope you're doing well. My name is Jason Fitzgerald, and welcome to the Strength Running Podcast. My job is to bring you the experts, the exercise scientists, best-selling authors, elite runners, top coaches, and renowned physiotherapists who can help you bring your running to the next level. Like I enjoy saying, knowledge is a competitive advantage. And today is no different. I have an excellent conversation in store for you today with Christy Ashwanden. She's a writer currently working for the data journalism site 538.com as their lead science writer. I love 538 because their stuff is based on data and evidence. And that's exactly the mindset that Christy brings to her book, Good to Go. Now, I'm about 50% of the way through the book and I've skimmed the rest. And wow, let me tell you, this is the definitive book about recovery methods and which work and which don't. If you have any questions about any recovery method, whether that's ice baths or heat or compression or cupping or yoga or any other thing that you can think about, you're going to love this book. Now, I should note that this interview is just an excerpt of our full conversation, which is for our team strength running group coaching program. Unlike a typical interview, members often get to ask their own questions of our guests, so it's much more interactive. If you like the opportunity or you just want to see what the team is all about, head on over to strengthrunning.com slash TSR to learn more. I also want to thank SteadyMD for sponsoring today's episode. SteadyMD pairs you with a primary care doctor online who's available via phone, text, or video for all your needs. And not just any doctor, but a fellow runner who understands running. Go to SteadyMD.com slash strengthrunning to learn more and reserve your spot. There are a limited number of spots available, so check them out at SteadyMD.com slash strengthrunning. All right, now it's time for my conversation with Christy Eschwanden. Please enjoy. Hey, Christy, it's great to be speaking with you. Thanks so much for having me. So I've started reading your book, Good to Go, and I'm loving how you dive into practically every recovery modality there is. You know, you go into cryotherapy, drinking beer after runs to see if that works. You Mm -hmm. talk about cupping and You know, I was tempted to start this conversation and and really just have this be about, you know, which methods work and which methods don't work. Uh, But I think that we can actually do a little bit better for our listeners. And and I think you think so, too, because you wrote in your book, it's not enough to ask, does this thing work? And I found, found that really, really interesting. And I wanted to dive into that a little bit. Why is it not enough to ask, does this thing work? So when you ask what it does it work? You know, that seems like a pretty straightforward question, but it turns out you can't really answer it until you know, what would working look like? So in other words, how would I know that it's working? Or what do I mean by does this work? What are you really trying to get out of it? And how would you know that this thing is providing that? So yeah, it's much more complex, it sounds like than is this thing working for me? Um, I, I think it's important to differentiate between many of the unscientific stories that we hear, you know, the the N equals one, it worked for me stories that we hear all over the place, and actual recovery methods that have been studied and have proven to have some sort of measurable recovery benefit that that also has been replicated. You know, I think that's some good uh, rigor when whenever we're evaluating a recovery modality. How do you differentiate between those two? Yeah, I mean, this is why we rerun randomized controlled trials, right? Because it's really easy to be misled by personal anecdotes. And I think the place to start here is to think about, okay, this thing that I'm looking at, so in this case, we're talking about recovery. You have to sort of start from a base of thinking, okay, what is the natural sort of outcome of this? And so if I didn't do anything, what would I expect to happen? Because what you're trying to do is alter that, right? So you're trying to expedite recovery, say. And so you need to sort of remember, okay, so if I hadn't done any of this, what what would happen then? And okay, so I did this thing, but is 
what happened as a result of that any different than what I would have expected had I not done that? And the thing is, it's really hard to answer that because you, there's only one of you and you only have this one experience. You can go back and, and do it again, but you know, a lot of the variables are going to be different. So that personal anecdote, um, you know, this is not to say that you can't learn things from your own personal experience. You absolutely can. Um, but it's really easy to mistake sort of the natural course of things with something getting better from, you know, this, this thing that you're doing. And I'll just give you an example. The common cold, we've all had one of these, right? And they're, they can be pretty miserable. And the thing is, you know, there's all these things that people do to try and, and treat their colds, but none of them really work very, very well. And the thing about a cold is that it has a natural course. And so regardless of what you do, you know, in a few days or a week, you're going to get better. And the thing that happens is, it's kind of the point at which it becomes most miserable that you decide to go out and do something, whether it's take a vitamin or some special tea or whatever that thing is. But that point at which you're most miserable is usually probably the low point of the trajectory of that cold. And so no matter what you did, that was probably the worst of it and you're going to get better and you're going to feel better. So you may do something at that point and say, oh, after that, I felt a lot better and it really worked. But if you hadn't done it, you would have felt better too. And so this is just one example of the ways in which you know your personal example can your personal anecdote can really lead astray. This reminds me of the marathon runner who two or three days after the race goes and gets a massage because they're incredibly sore. And then over the course of the next couple of days, they start feeling better. And they're like, wow, that massage was really great. But then again, you're also five or six days post marathon and you're starting to feel a lot better. So very similar, I think. Absolutely. You know, delayed onset muscle soreness usually peaks about two days later. So that, you know, that's a perfect example of what I was talking about. Can athletes fool themselves into thinking that some recovery method that they're incorporating into their training is helping them when it's not actually? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, my book has a whole chapter about the placebo effect. And I think that, you know, we're so often when we talk about placebos, we think of that as a bad thing and something where, well, it's all in your head and therefore it's not real and it's not helping. But I think that it's important to note that sometimes this can be a really powerful thing and, and you know, a legitimate way to go about things. Um, your mind and body work together. Mind is part of the body. Um but yeah, it is possible to feel like something's working when it's not and to really that that expectation. I mean, there, there are so many studies that have been done on placebos showing that your expectation about something can influence the actual outcome that, that you find. And particularly when you're dealing with things that are subjective in nature, so something like soreness or fatigue, yeah, that has a really large uh, subjective component to it. And so if you're expecting to feel better, it's pretty likely that you will. You know, Christy, one of the things I've noticed about just the, you know, and I'm coming at this from a, a runner's perspective because mm -hmm. you know, I was a runner and I'm a running coach now. And one of the things I've noticed from when I started to run about 20 years ago and running today is that you can walk into any sports store or go on Amazon and search for recovery and you're going to find thousands of products that claim yeah. to help you recover faster and, you know, ready yourself for your next training session. Uh, and I'm just, I can't help but think, have we made recovery just way too complicated? Yeah, I think that's one of the takeaways of my book. And, you know, I, I write in there that, when I was a serious athlete, um, recovery was something, wasn't something that you did. It was all the things you weren't doing. Um, you know, it was putting your feet up. It was not going out, staying up late at night, you know, things like that. Now it's become this thing where there are all these things that people feel like they have to do. So it's like you have to foam roll and you have to go in the ice bath and you have to do, you know, it's sort of another obligation and almost an extension of training. Um, and I think that there can come a point where this is really backfiring if it just becomes its source of stress. And so that's not helpful. So yeah, I would say we have made it overly complicated because again, at its most basic level, recovery is just rest and relaxation. And there are a lot of ways to do that that don't require products or all of these things that you're doing. It's really, you know, it's like lying on the couch with a book. That's a really good recovery method. <laughs> and ironically, all these uh, extra things that we feel like we have to do and products that we might feel pressure to buy is just making it more stressful and adding to our to do list and and almost our, our mental load, too. And that, that just seems to, to actually work in the opposite direction that we want to be going. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that um, one of the selling points with a lot of these products is they really exploit this fear of missing out and the sense that everyone's doing this thing. So it must be really effective and it must be working. And if I'm not doing that, you know, I might be losing this chance to optimize everything. And there's this idea that, you know, there's an optimal state that we can get our bodies into. And if we can just reach that, everything will be perfect and we'll uh, achieve peak performance. But it turns out that our bodies are really, really adaptable. And you know, it's not not as much of a fine balance as people would like you to believe. Um, you, you're going to be okay without having that special drink or that particular product, you know, using on your body. Our, our bodies are pretty good at, at recovering if we just give them the time and, you know, the rest that they need to do that. So the placebo effect is kind of real. There's almost an unlimited number of products out there you can buy. You've admitted we've kind of made this whole issue a little bit too complicated. So I don't know, what is a simple but effective mindset to have about recovery? How should we think about it so that we don't overstress ourselves and we don't just start adding things to our to-do list to recover before our next run? How, How do we think about this? I think one really useful frame is to think about it is taking some time to do nothing, you know, real true downtime where you're not, your mind isn't racing, you're not running around, you know, really common um, mistake that people make. And I, I made it myself in the early days is you take a rest day, but then you use that day to run around and do all kinds of things and maybe deal with stressful other things in your, your life. Maybe you're doing your taxes or you're, you're doing some complicated errands or something. And that's not, an actual rest day, you know, what your body really needs is time to just say, ah, you know, maybe it's a nap, maybe it's curling up with a great novel, maybe it is, um, you know, sitting in a hot tub. It doesn't really matter the exact thing that you're doing, but I think the objective here should be to truly relax. Um, and I think you know, that's kind of gotten lost. It's, it's, it sounds easy. It can be really hard to do in practice. Christy, what is relaxing and how do you do it? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't understand. In 2019, what is this right. relaxing you speak of? Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> right. It's like, turn off your phone, put your phone away, turn off the internet, you know, uh, do not be distracted, be fully present. You know, it's interesting because hearing you talk about recovery it's almost like there's this mental component to it as well and and it seems like you know we've been talking more about the physical side of things but you know how important is it to prioritize mental recovery and and let's just say this is after a really hard uh, competition or a race like a marathon or a really long season are, are the recovery methods any different for uh, recovering mentally from your exercise or your training yeah so this this uh mental recovery is fundamental to the whole process. In fact, it's, you know, you you can't be properly recovered without addressing this aspect of it. And I guess, you know, the important thing to know here is that your body, um, you know, your body re- stress the same way, whether it's physical stress or emotional stress. And so if you're feeling stress in your life, you know, whether it's like problems at work, problems at home, um, whatever, that taxes your body in the same way that a workout does. It may not be one particular muscle, but you will get the same sort of fatigue. It is something that will prevent you from being fully recovered. And so you really cannot be in this this fully recovered state without doing something to reduce stress, to, to reduce this mental stress that we often just sort of call stress. And so this is why it's it's just crucially important that you you find something in your life that will help you to reduce stress and address the stress in your life. And there, you know, it's that's going to be really individual. Um, what that could be for some people, it might be meditation. You know, for me, I think that one of the most important things I do in my day is I walk my dog up the hill every morning, and it's a way to um, just sort of connect with my place. It's quiet. I'm connecting with my husband goes with me and our dog. You know, it's just a, a really nice time to be really present. You know, it's mild exercise, which is good. It gives me a chance to kind of suss out how I'm feeling that day. If I've done a hard workout the day before, um, I might feel some soreness and that gives me a chance to kind of assess where where I'm at and how I'm feeling. And this is another thing that's really important is that 
athletes really need to develop a sense of being able to know how they're feeling and really where their bodies are at. And this is much harder than it seems. You really have to sort of train yourself to know the signs and to know that, you know, the soreness here means this. Or, you know, for me, when I wake up in the morning, with a little bit of a sore throat, I know that that means I'm I'm overextended and my body's sort of crying out, I need some more rest. So you really need to be able to learn to read those signs and to recognize them. You know, it's interesting hearing you talk about this because when I look back on my running career, all of my best races, and not necessarily my fastest times, although that's mostly true, but the races where I felt like I just ran a really, really great race were when I was in a spot that I was feeling positive about myself and my training. I was optimistic about what might happen in the race. I was Mm -hmm. not experiencing a a lot of stress. And I can't help but think that if you are going to race well and perform at a high level for you, then you have to really take that mental recovery seriously because you're not going to, you know, run good times or, or feel good on your workouts if you are just really stressed and, you know, you're feeling negative about your training. So the mental piece to me is, is so much more than recovery. It's also about optimizing your performances as well. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And the best way to run fast is to be relaxed in every sense of that. And you can't be relaxed if you're stressed about other things or you're you know, having a bad day or in a bad mood. And here I'll just say too, one really interesting thing is that um, one of the best indicators of overtraining is actually poor mood. So you know, it might be crankiness, depression, but also just a feeling of not feeling like going out for the run. And so, you know, oftentimes what will happen is the runner will be in that state, they're sort of um, crossing the line into overtraining and they don't feel like training, they're in a bad mood, but they sort of take that on as like, oh, now I'm really terrible, things are bad, I really have to push harder because, you know, what's wrong with me? And like, what's wrong with you is your body saying, I need some more rest. (laughs) That's pretty simple. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. You know, Christy, I want to share a slightly incriminating story with you. Um, Uh, Sure. (laughs) When I was in college, um, you know, I was on the, the track and cross country teams and, uh, you know, we were pretty good about not partying too much, but Saturday mm-hmm. night came along and no matter how, uh, you know, much of a hermit we were during the week, kind of focusing on sleep and our studies and training and all that, uh, Saturday night came around and we went pretty wild. And for <sighs> me, it was, it was almost a way to let loose psychologically so that, Mm -hmm. okay, I had a lot of fun, you know, 20, 21, 22 years old in college. I kind of need that outlet, that release. And then, you know, Sunday comes along, you know, you you rehydrate and, you know, I can make it through another week of hard training and, you know, living a life that's conducive to, you know, hard training. Um, But that, that Saturday night out was almost necessary for me to be able to mentally grapple with that training. Is, Is that recovery or am I kidding myself? (laughs) <laughs> well, that's a great question. And I can just say, you know, uh, I could relate to that scenario. I ran at, at University of Colorado and I was uh, I was once called into the coach's office on a Monday morning uh, regarding some shenanigans that our team had done on a Saturday night. Um, <laughs> <Shenanigans>. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, so, so the, my answer here, I think, is twofold. One is that it's absolutely true that we have a need for this sort of letting loose, relaxing, letting go of, you know, runners in particular tend to be so driven. And, you know, that's great, but it can be you know, to the point where you, you just aren't able to relax because you're pushing so hard. Um, I've heard some people call this social recovery, and I like that term a lot. And so this goes back to sort of the the mental aspect of things of just sort of finding a way to let go of some of those things to relax and to to get in a state where, you know, maybe on the track that day, you've been doing intervals together, really pushing each other. But then that evening, it's like, okay, now we can, you know, let loose a little bit, relax and and be in a, a different state. And so that's really important. The problem here, and and so I'll just say, so that the first chapter of my book is about beer and running. So anyone with questions about that should uh, get the book and read. I go into great detail, as you know, about that. But the takeaway really is that a little bit of alcohol is not going to hurt you. It's not bad. And I do think that 
very often um, so much of what we're seeking and doing when we have a beer after a run is it's this this signal sort of to ourselves that it's time to relax. It's a time to, um, you know, commiserate with your friends and, and that's all good. And so a beer and in some instances, maybe two are, are going to be fine. The thing that is not good and that is absolutely bad for your recovery is a scenario that can be common among college students where yeah, you're going out and not just having one drink, but many and getting drunk and that's that's not going to be helpful (laughs) yeah it was probably helpful mentally but not helpful physically it's important to (laughs) differentiate between the two there exactly yeah absolutely (laughs) so all this talk of recovery really makes me think that you know at the end of the day the best way to make sure that you can recover adequately from your training is just to make sure that your workouts are appropriately because you know after all there's yeah. only so much you can recover from, you know, if you do something that is so extraordinarily grueling, you know, you're just going to have to sit around and do nothing and wait for your body to, um, to get back to neutral. But, you know, this leaves, this begs the question, how do you know whether you're pushing the effort at an appropriate level or you're just training too hard? Yeah. I mean, that's the million dollar question. And, you know, there have been so many people trying to find this, you know, this, I think in the the book, I call it the magic metric, you know, we're all looking for this one thing that we can look at that will say, okay, I'm overtraining, or this is this is the point at which I'm going too hard. And there isn't such a thing, except, you know, the answer really to this question of how do I feel? And so if you're feeling really moody, if you're feeling like you don't want to train, those are pretty good, good um, indicators that you're probably going over the line. And in fact, there's a a little uh, quiz called mood indicator that has, as far as I can tell, been the most powerful way to sort of determine whether someone's overtraining. It's a simple uh, little questionnaire that asks you things like, how are you sleeping? How are you feeling? Are you you know, more sore than you expect. How is your mood? Um, but there isn't some special thing that you can see on your heart rate monitor or your training log or on Strava or anything like that that will tell you. And you really have to, I mean, this really goes back to this concept of learning how to read your body and knowing what what certain signs mean for yourself. And this isn't something that that you can just learn in a book. This is something that really is only gained in experience. And I think the way to start is to just really pay close attention to what's happening, to what you're feeling, and to these factors that we know are important for recovery. So things like sleep, mood, um, just feel like, are your muscles sore? Are you feeling more sore than you would expect? Are you still feeling fatigue from that workout, you know, many days later when you expect to be recovered? Um, yeah, the important thing here is that you can only benefit from training that you're recovering from. And so you just really want to watch that too and see, okay, how long is it taking me? And if that's, that starts to become longer or you're starting to feel like you're losing your juice, then that's a really good sign that it's time to back off. You've talked a lot about experience and, you know, this makes me think that you have to learn through trial and error. And I think a lot of runners, they don't want to do the error part of the learning process. Um, And and I understand it's, it's not always so fun. Uh, And this just makes me think of, you know, all the, the fancy watches that we all have now. And many of these watches have a recovery feature in there where, you know, at the end of a workout, it'll tell you, okay, you need, you know, 26 hours to recover from this run. Is that just a bunch of hocus pocus or is there some real science behind those numbers? Great question. Um, So I tried out a bunch of those when I was working on the book. And what I found, I also tried to find out. So basically these gadgets all use algorithms that are proprietary. So it's, you, you, you don't know exactly how they're doing it. I mean, you can kind of guess based on, on what they're telling you, but in my experience, I never found one of these that was really helping me beyond what I could tell. You know, if I've done a really hard run when I'm done, I, I know that it's hard and I know I need a little bit of extra recovery. Um, the, the times that really stood out in my mind were times when it told me something that was wildly different than my interpretation. So I remember there was one time when I had done a, a really long endurance effort, the longest of, of the season, and it told me that it was a mild effort and I should train normally the next day. <laughs> I thought, are you crazy? Like, I'm going to take <laughs> the day off tomorrow. Um, so I think, you know, I do think that they can be helpful. Um, I don't want to be completely dismissive of them, but I think that, um, you know, they're just not a substitute for your own intuition and, and tracking. And really, all you need is a piece of paper, you know, to log your training. These fancy tools are great, and um, I have no problem with people using them, but, you know, 
the fancier things and the more data you have, it's it's not necessarily going to be helpful. And one danger, I think, with some of these things is that they can encourage you to start paying attention to the wrong thing. So, you know, morning heart rate is something that, uh, you know, when I was in high school, my my high school track coach would tell me, yeah, take your morning heart rate. That was a way to kind of gauge recovery. And it's not a terrible metric, but it's not completely accurate either. And there can be a lot of reasons why your morning heart rate might um, differentiate. And so, you know, it's something that you can take and it's useful, but you can't say that that's the end all and be all. And the danger is when people start paying more attention to the numbers and to how they're actually feeling. And it's that, how are you feeling? That's most important. You know, I've, I've, um, you know, grew up as a runner without these fancy watches and all these metrics. And, you know, I, I feel like I've found a kindred spirit here because I've been shouting into the void for the last <laughs> couple of years that you should be relying more on perceived effort. And, you know, these metrics aren't always very accurate. Uh, and, and I just can't shake the feeling that being deluged with this constant amount of data that most runners don't even really understand how to analyze, it, it's just causing more harm than good. Cause I think some of the metrics can be really helpful. You know, how far you ran, what your average pace was, your mile splits, you know, some of the basic stuff. But yeah. when, we, when we start getting into vertical oscillation and, and right. things like ground contact time and, and how that balances between your left and right foot and, and runners are just like, well, is what is this? What do these numbers mean? How do I decipher these numbers? And, and I can't help but think that in a sport that relies on so much on how you feel in your perception of how you feel, that we are walling ourselves off from being able to communicate with our own body. It, it, what do you think about that? Oh, absolutely. And I'll just point out here, I'm a data journalist. You know, I work for 538, a data journalism website. We're, we're known for this. I'm a data geek. So it's not like I'm afraid of numbers or I don't like that stuff. Um, but what I found, and this is kind of universally true with all things data, is that, you know, data is not the same as information. And you really need to ask, you know, am I measuring the right thing? What is it telling me? And is that useful? And another thing that I think is really important to ask is, okay, what am I getting out of this, whatever this measure is, like, how will that change what I do? So if I get different numbers from this particular test, so you mentioned like ground oscillation or something like, okay, so what what is that going to tell me? And like, how am I going to do something differently because of that? And if the answer is, well, I'm not going to really do anything differently, then it's probably a waste of time. You know, there are a bunch of tests now that are being marketed that are supposed to tell you, um, you know, things like diet and, and things like that. And really a lot of them come down to like, you take the test and it tells you eat your vegetables and, you know, that's great, but you don't need a blood test to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. Now, now you've talked about specific things. I'd love to get into some more details about specific recovery tactics or strategies. And I thought maybe a really good place to start would be to ask you how you might structure your recovery after a, a big race like a marathon. So what would Christy do after a 26.2 mile race? <laughs> well, I guess here I should disclose that I have only done one running marathon in my life. And it was actually, it was actually, I found out, this is kind of disconcerting. I found out on the starting line that it actually was the guy, the guy with the starting gun said, Oh, I should tell you, it's actually more like 27, maybe 27 and a half miles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. This was uh, the Breckenridge Crest Trail Marathon and a uh, great race, but high altitude, uh, you know, trail run. Um, anyway, and after that, I remember very distinctly, I got in the car and I had to go to a graduation party <laughs> afterwards. So probably not the best recovery method. But I, I will tell you what I do now after long. So um, it's winter right now. And so my main activity is, is cross country skiing. And over the Christmas holidays, um, I did a long, I did a ski marathon uh, with a friend and afterwards I was pretty toast. So what did I do? I took, I came home and I took a hot shower, which felt really, really good and kind of lingered in there a little bit. I'm a huge fan of heat. I think it's great. Um, I got a massage the next day, also felt good. Um, and I slept, I took a day off. And then from there, I actually just kind of paid attention to how I was feeling. And I had kind of expected that I was just going to be completely wrecked for days and days. And so I had, had sort of planned out, you know, was not planning to do a lot of training that week. But it turned out that after taking that day off, getting a massage and really focusing on sleep too, I actually felt pretty good. And a few days later, I was able to 
go back to doing what I was going to do. And I, I wasn't doing anything super hard, but, you know, a lot of it is just feeling like, you know, assessing Am I feeling tired still? If I'm still feeling tired, I shouldn't probably do a hard effort. I probably don't want to go too long today. But just sort of taking that daily feedback and asking yourself, you know, the perpetual question, how am I feeling? I love it. It's very <laughs> uh, personalized to what, you know, what you like to do and, and what you've found to work for you. So if we boil it down, it sounds like you prioritized getting uh, a, a lot of sleep those couple yes. nights after the event. And mm -hmm. you took a day off from work, which I think is very interesting. I used to do that after all of my big marathons, because I think the last yep. thing I wanted to do was <laughs> go be professional <laughs> when I was right. feeling pretty terrible. Uh, yeah. it, and that, I think, has a mental component to it as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just, you know, eliminating stress, again, it goes back to this idea that it's not just physical stress, it's the emotional stress and all of that. And, you know, one, one mistake that people will make, and I have made it so much myself in my athletic career is, you know, oftentimes our competitions come with a lot of travel. And so you get back from your event, and you've been traveling and, and travel in and of itself is a major, major stress. And I think that this is underappreciated by a lot of athletes that you just really need to give give yourself some extra time when you are traveling um, to recover. And the other thing about travel is it can really interfere with your sleep. So that's another whole whole thing to think about. I have a whole chapter in the book about sleep and talk about some of these things and some really interesting methods that some teams have come up with to handle some of that stuff. Um, but So it's just important to recognize that that emotional stress is just as important as the physical one and to, to give yourself time and to not rush it. I think that's another common mistake is people just think that there's a shortcut and there really isn't. No shortcuts. Yeah, I, no. Thought it was very, I thought it was very interesting, the section in your book talking about uh, NBA teams and yeah. how uh, West Coast teams traveling East had an advantage because they were playing, um, you know, at a, a, a an earlier time and they weren't sacrificing sleep compared to the East Coast guys who were traveling out to the West Coast. Uh, and, I, and I felt like that was a really interesting thing that, you know, the NBA might be interested in, particularly the East Coast uh, team owners and coaches who don't want to give the West Coast teams an unfair advantage. I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, yeah, it's something that's been talked about a lot in the NBA. They also have a really rigorous schedule with without a lot of breaks, and it's something that's you know, been widely discussed there of whether they're running their their players you know too too hard and whether they're getting enough enough rest. And so it's definitely something people are thinking about. And it's interesting in the NBA, naps are really popular, and there's a reason for that. <laughs> Yeah, I just listened to a podcast uh, over on the the Tim Ferriss podcast with um, it was uh, a basketball player, LeBron James and his trainer. And I thought it was interesting them talking about recovery because, you know, pro athletes, they're going to do a lot of crazy, weird things that may not work, may not be effective. Maybe there's a placebo effect, but their big focus is on making sure that he's eating like some really great nutrient dense foods all the time and that he's getting a lot of sleep. Uh, and that's, you know, not only at night, but he's taking those regular naps. And, you know, even at the, the highest levels of the NBA, they're still just focusing on the fundamentals. And I think that's very instructive. Yeah, I mean, if you don't get the fundamentals, nothing else matters. I mean, it's it's silly to worry about you know, some kind of supplement or foam roller or something if you're not sleeping enough. And it's amazing how often, though, people neglect sleep and they think that they're going to make up for it with some device. <laughs> right. Now, you mentioned um, you got a massage the day after or mm -hmm. two days after uh, your race. Was was this just there to help you feel better uh, just in that very subjective way? Or uh, did you learn some real great things about massage that, that wanted you to, you know, make you go get one? Yeah. So massage is a really interesting, really interesting thing because it's something that I think is almost universally loved by athletes. It feels really good. I mean, it really is something that gets most people into a state of relaxation. Now, granted, sometimes when you're getting a sports massage, it can be kind of intense, but it also gives you a really important sense of your body feel. So it's a way of sort of connecting to how all your different parts are, you know, how sore they are, whether you have a knot in your muscle, things like that. And I think that body awareness can be really helpful for people. I know that I find it really useful. But frankly, you know, lying down on a table for an hour and relaxing, your, you know, with a specific purpose of relaxing your muscles, like that is almost the dictionary definition of 
recovery. And so um, I don't think that we have to look for it to, you know, change some blood chemistry or something like that to say that it works. Um, There aren't a lot of um, established physiological mechanisms by which Massage helps recovery, but it absolutely helps with the psychological aspect of it. And and really anything that makes you feel better, um, you know, that's a qualitative thing, but that qualitative part is a really fundamental component of recovery. And so we shouldn't just dismiss that. I can't help but think about massage as as a forced one hour break from digital media and your phone and any any screen and and that is in a way a really great way to relax and just you know you you shut your eyes on the massage table and another person is touching you it's a very intimate experience and that I, I think is enormously relaxing. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a great point. You know, it really, it's a time where you just have to shut everything else off. And, you know, in our modern world, that can become increasingly hard to do. Now, I want to ask a question from one of our uh, team members. Um, Mm -hmm. So we have uh, a runner named Chris wants to know more about refueling right after a run. And he's curious about that 30 minute window that we all hear about for recovery, you know, eat something within 30 minutes. Is it really that important for recovery? I mean, what about 45 minutes or 60 minutes? Yeah, so the recovery window, this is so interesting. Um, So I have a quote in the book uh, from one expert saying, it's really more like a barn door. So this idea that, that we really have to get some some calories in and some refueling right away after exercise is a really appealing idea. It's something that sort of makes intuitive sense. And, you know, the early studies were really showing that this might be the case. And so it wasn't a, a, a situation where people were just making stuff up and it was wrong. It was a situation where interesting studies uh, had some findings that were really intriguing. And then we sort of got ahead of the science, though. And so what happened was subsequent studies, and the more that people did studies on this, the more they found that, well, it's not really as crucial as we thought. And this goes back to the idea, too, that our bodies are really, really um, capable of recovering whether we do everything right or not. And so it's sort of like um, the gas tank in your car. If you go out for a long drive and deplete it, yeah, your gas tank's empty and it's really ready to receive gas, right? And so you need to fill up the tank. But whether you do it like immediately after that drive or if you begin your next drive with you know, a trip to the gas station, either way, you're going to be okay. And, and your body's kind of the same way. As long as you get uh, a regular meal in in some sort of timely fashion so you don't want to wait 12 or 24 hours but you know if you you can wait until your next regularly scheduled meal and you're going to be okay now the the difference here would be if you're at you know some sort of event where you're going to be performing again, or if you're in a situation where you're doing two a days, then you might want to make sure that you get some fuel in between those workouts. But again, it doesn't have to be within like a really specific window. You're, you're going to be okay. You know, Christy, I wanted to end with a really fun hypothetical for you. And and I think this would be a, really instructive for our listeners. Uh, I want you to imagine that you're standing in front of the entire U.S. Olympic team, all the sports, and they want to know quite simply how to optimize recovery. You only have a couple sentences to get your message across. What would you say to them? Okay. So I would say here are the three secrets to recovery. (laughs) Oh, secrets. I love it. Yes. One, sleep, right? Sleep. Just sleep. Get enough sleep. (laughs) Don't skim on sleep. Two is um, do something to manage the stress in your life. And this is going to be an individual thing, but manage your stress. Find a way to deal it. Reduce the stress in your life. So that's number two. And then the third would be find some ritual for relaxing. This is your recovery ritual. And it can be anything that you want that makes you feel rested and makes you feel relaxed. So it could be um, putting your feet up on on the couch with the book. It could be uh, taking a hot shower. It could be getting a massage. It could be, there's just an endless array of things that it could be, but find something that for you makes you feel relaxed and is something that you can sort of ritualize so that when you do it, it's sort of a cue both to your mind and to your body that, oh, it's time to rest. It's time to relax. It's time to recover. Now, I noticed you didn't mention, you know, a $130 vibrating foam roller. (laughs) It, right. That's not that effective, I guess. 
Um, people love their foam rollers. I'm not about to to uh, you know extract them from their their death grips. <laughs> if foam rolling works for you, if you like it, if if it feels good, do it. Um, I didn't find compelling evidence that it's a be all or end all or the secret magic for recovery. Um, but again, you know, there's some intriguing stuff. It may be helpful, may be helpful in some situations. Um, but it's nothing like sleep. It's nothing like stress reduction in terms of overall recovery. <laughs> I was being a little facetious there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, that's, that's oh, but very people good. love that. I'm learning that people love their foam rollers. I've had numerous people tell me, I want to, I want to hear everything you learn, but just don't tell me to stop foam rolling. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's because, you know, you said if it makes you feel good, do it. And runners have this love hate relationship with their foam roller. Maybe that's yeah. why we get the crazy ones with the huge bumps on them because we want it to hurt <laughs> even more. You know, it right. hurts so good. You'll hear runners say, and and maybe that's a good lesson too. Is if something makes you feel good, then it probably has some good recovery aspects to it. Yeah, and I also think that you know foam rolling can be really unpleasant too, and it can hurt. And that goes back to this notion of you know placebos are more powerful when they're unpleasant. So it could be at play there. I'm just guessing. Fascinating. Now, Christy, this was this was really interesting. And, uh, you know, I have only skimmed through uh, your book, and I've only maybe read about 20% of it. So I, I have a lot more work to do. And it's it's just so interesting to learn about all these different uh, recovery modalities and, and what you've learned over the course of, of writing this. Now, folks are going to want to follow your work because you're doing some really interesting things. Where can we find you online? Yeah, so my website is just my name, christyashwanden.com. On Twitter, I'm Craig Crest. That's C-R-A-G-C-R-E-S-T. It's like a craggy crest. It's it's actually a place name. It's my favorite trail run around here, the Craig Crest on the Grand Mesa. Um, and then to find out more about my book, I have a website, goodtogobook.com. And that there you will find information on where to order it. And I'm also about to embark on a book tour uh, that has right now 18 stops. So I'm going to be pretty busy in the next month and a half or so. Um, but yeah, those are the best ways to find me. And I also should mention that I am about to launch a new podcast, um, which is actually not about running or sports. It's called Emerging Form, and it's a podcast about the creative process. But I think that it's kind of applicable to runners, too. Um, one of our episodes in this first season is about talent and this question of, is talent necessary and can you overcome a lack of talent? And so I think that that might be one that runners will enjoy. Oh, I love that. And I'm just sitting here like, no, talent's not that important. Keep working hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, you'll you, then you should definitely um, listen because my co-host is a poet. And to the two of us, we get into a pretty uh, heated discussion about this. And we, we don't necessarily agree on everything regarding talent. So it's a fun one. Well, Christy, I know you have a February 4th appearance in Denver, and uh, if I can swing it with my family, I'd love to come by and get my copy of the book signed. So hopefully I'll see you in, in just a few days. Oh, that would be fantastic. Looking forward to it. <laughs> All right, Christy. Well, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Hey all, thanks again for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Christy and you came away with it with a few extra lessons that you can hopefully incorporate into your own training so that you can just make yourself feel better. If you'd like the full interview and want to learn more about team strength running, get on the priority list at strengthrunning.com slash TSR to be the first to know when we open and how you can become our next member. Finally, a big shout out to Steady MD. Strength Running is an official partner of SteadyMD, which is led by sub-3 marathoner Dr. Josh Emder. The goal is to give you a personal doctor online that's just for runners to help you stay fit, healthy, injury-free, and competitive. The best part, there's no co-pays, waiting rooms, or surprise bills. Instead, you're going to get same-day responses from a doctor who's there for you 24-7. If you've ever seen a doctor or maybe a physical therapist who has no experience with runners, then you know how valuable this is to hard-charging athletes. Having a doctor who gets you and your running goals is priceless. Go to SteadyMD.com slash strengthrunning to see if there are any spots left and how you can benefit from having a PCP who's also a runner. One more time, that's SteadyMD.com slash strengthrunning to see all the details. Thanks again, everyone. I appreciate you being here. Until next time. <laughs>